Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. Now we are all that remains. Though we are always looking for men and women capable of helping us restore what has been lost. In return, we offer this, our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. We've made great efforts to restore this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Greetings, members. I am Lieutenant Colonel Valeria Faustina. I've given the operative the day off, and last I saw, he and Stein were heading up to the resort for a well-earned bit of R&R. &R. I told them to stay away from the spa, however. We still haven't quite fixed the Asultron masseuses. Modus asked that I provide a recording of my story for his historical archive. And although almost everyone here in the bunker is from Vault 76, every one of us has their own story. This is mine. There are little lies that we tell ourselves, and the bigger lies that we tell to the children. And then there are the lies told by Vault Tech, and perhaps the biggest lie of all, everything will be okay. For the past 25 years, that's what the Overseer told us. She said that Reclamation Day would be a new beginning for us and a new start for America. And for 25 years, everyone in Vault 76 believed her. Well, almost everyone. My parents, Albert and Beatrice, were under no such illusions. You see, while they might have been selected for the Vault, they were no ordinary citizens. They were government operatives who had worked some of the most classified projects in Appalachia. Their orders were to monitor the vault from the inside and prepare for their own assignment after Reclamation Day. And for 25 years, that's exactly what they did. Not even the overseer was aware of what their true purpose was. When I was born, four years after the Great War, it was a joyous occasion in the vault. Every new birth was celebrated as a signal of a brighter future, that everything will be okay. My parents, who I always called Sir and Ma'am, took it upon themselves to make sure I did not become a starry-eyed, typical vault dweller, believing whatever vault tech had told us, what the overseer kept telling us. From the beginning, I was exposed to the harsh, unvarnished truth of the world. I was taught that sometimes people had to do bad things for good to triumph. My parents loved their country and had done and would do whatever was necessary to protect it from those who would do it harm both foreign and domestic. They also believed that one must always be able to face the truth of one's actions, that if you have to lie to yourself, then you cannot truly be committed to the cause. I was five years old when they told me the stories of the first people they were forced to kill and why. My early childhood was filled with typical vault education, followed by my real education given by my parents. There were only a few other children I was allowed to spend time with, and over those first years, fewer that would socialize with me. Not that I minded. I was never really interested in childish games. One of the families we did sometimes socialize with was Lucius and Megan Alistair. My parents knew Megan from their time in the military, and Lucius had been a researcher at West Tech. They also had a daughter, Lilith, who was probably my best and only friend. She was a year younger than me, and, well... She had plenty of secrets of her own. In the vault tech classes, I excelled in history, mathematics, and physics, whereas Lilith was so much more interested in biology and chemistry. I remember the day we got to perform vivisection on frogs and mice. Some of the kids hated it, and one even refused to do it at all. Not Lilith. She went at it with an enthusiasm that I don't think any of us had ever seen. After class, a number of the remaining animals went missing. Over the years, some of the other vault pets and animals would go missing from time to time. As much as the teachers and even security tried to figure out where they went, no one ever figured out what happened to them. Well, no one but me. One day, I spotted Lilith heading down to the old maintenance section. She loved to show off her chemistry skills, and I thought she might be looking for some new ingredients for her various concoctions. I still remember the day she cooked up a small explosive in the janitor's closet, we all got a big laugh when the maintenance staff got covered in soapy water when their buckets exploded the moment they added Abraxo to the water. 
I thought I did my parents proud that day when how I was able to sneak up behind her. Lilith never even noticed me as she made her way to a small intake grill behind the water reclamation tanks. She carefully removed the cover and disappeared inside. Well, I just had to know what she was doing. It was like my first secret mission, just like the stories my parents would tell me. I gave her a few minutes to get wherever she was going and then followed behind. It was good that we were so young because the space was a tight fit. The intake pipe was fairly straight, so I just kept moving forward until I could see a small light ahead to where the pipe opened up into a larger space. I snuck up to the edge and peeked around the corner and discovered exactly what Lilith was doing and also what happened to all of those animals. Lilith had turned the little space into her own abattoir. Hanging in one corner were skinned dogs and cats. The bones of mice, frogs, and other animals I couldn't identify had been stacked in another, and in the middle of it all was Lilith. I couldn't see exactly what she was doing because she was facing away from me, but the blood-spattered ground in front of her, along with the sound of crunching bone, made it obvious. I observed her for a few minutes more. She seemed to relish the raw meat she was eating and giggled like she was telling herself a little joke. I left as quietly as I arrived, confident that she never saw me. I guess I should have been unnerved or disgusted, but instead I was fascinated. Lilith had hidden this secret side of herself. Everyone else just thought she was odd, but I knew better. And I suspected there was so much more to learn, as I would confirm years later. My parents strove to teach me everything they could. I was a voracious reader and devoured the technical manuals and history books that my father provided. He would sit me down after dinner and lecture me on military tactics, interrogation techniques, and political manipulation. My mother, as a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor, supervised my physical education. Between the strenuous workouts in the vault gymnasium, we would spar in the boxing ring. We were asked, politely of course, to keep our sessions private, as it was disconcerting to the other residents to watch my mother put me in the infirmary on multiple occasions. It never bothered me, of course. My mother was always there for me, and what she did, she did only because she wanted me to be as prepared as possible for whatever we might face after Reclamation Day. And each time we fought, I strove to be better, faster, stronger, until the day that I was the one who put her in the infirmary. I found out later that it was the happiest day in my mother's life. When I turned 16, my parents gave me a small party in our little vault apartment. That was when they revealed their real mission to me, and what we were supposed to do after Reclamation Day, and the first time they spoke about the Enclave. As the years went by, families expanded and the vault grew more crowded. We saw the overseer every day, mingling with children and relating tales of her life in pre-war Appalachia. At night, I would overhear my parents talking about her, about how she wasn't even supposed to be our overseer, that she had originally been assigned to Vault 101 outside of Washington, D.C. They even said that the overseer had found out about what was going on in the other vaults, and that she should have been dealt with, not promoted. A couple of years before Reclamation Day, we had our first serious accident in the vault. We all knew something was wrong when we felt the apartment shake, and we heard a hollow boom sound from somewhere down below us. My father went out to see what was going on, while my mother locked the two of us in our quarters. Before my mother closed the door, I could have sworn that I saw Lilith standing alone in the hallway vestibule, watching the commotion, and she had the strangest smile on her face. I found out later that there had been an explosion in the Water Reclamation Center. Four people died, including two maintenance crew and both of Lilith's parents. No one could figure out what they were doing there, as neither they nor the maintenance staff had any responsibilities in the area. The overseer had the whole area sealed off, and people tried to forget about the incident. Lilith kept to herself mostly after that. I'd see her from time to time that same strange little smile on her face when she thought no one was looking. And one day, after class, I came back to my room and found a handwritten note on my bed. Thanks for keeping my little secret. It was signed, Lil. I carefully folded the note and slid it into my journal. 
So she had seen me and trusted me. It doesn't. Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices and discover the real world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. The night before Reclamation Day, the whole vault got together for a huge party, and even my parents decided to attend. The party was something to behold. I had never seen the staff and everyone else so excited. My parents made me come with them to the party because they said it would look strange and suspicious if we weren't there. There was plenty of singing, dancing, and people drinking. A lot. Even the teenagers, my age and even younger, were getting tipsy on all sorts of concoctions that the staff put together trying to use up the remaining stocks of alcohol. I even got to have some fancy lad snack cakes. They were really my only guilty pleasure in the vault. I admit, I snuck a few sips of what Miss Marcia called an atomic sunset. Well, maybe more than a few sips. And I was actually having a good time, sort of. Until my evening ended when Bobby Stoller, a boy from down the hall, tried to kiss me. Maybe if I'd had boring parents, that would have gone differently. Though, even then, he was really not my type. Instead, Barely thinking about it, I saw what he was going to do and leaned into the momentum as he turned me around and broke his nose with the right cross. The entire party suddenly got deathly silent, and I realized what I'd done, looking down at Bobby on the floor. When I looked up and saw my parents, I couldn't quite tell if they were angry or proud of me. My mother gathered me up and walked me back to my room while my father was busy explaining to Bobby's parents what had happened and how sorry he was for the accident. Mother didn't say anything until we got far enough into the hallway, away from the crowds. Valeria, you need to control your emotions. That kind of response can get you into a situation you might not be prepared for. But, and her frown turned into a mischievous grin, that was a beautiful punch and that lowlife brute deserved it. She put her arm around me and we walked back into our quarters together, for the first time like a mother and daughter, not a teacher and student. Later, my father returned to our quarters. He looked at us with a small smile on his face. Tomorrow is the big day. I don't mind that we all had a little fun this evening, and he winked at me. But out there, he pointed towards the direction of the vault entrance, out there is the real world. And it won't be the world that your mother and I remember. You need to be prepared to anticipate and react as we've taught you. When we leave this vault, you won't just be our daughter. You'll be an operative, and we have a job to do. He took my hand and pulled me up from my chair. And then he did the most unexpected thing. He hugged me. When he let go, he looked just a little bit older and maybe even a little sad. We've done all we can to prepare you, and I wanted to tell you how proud both your mother and I are of you. I walked back to my room, finally feeling the weight of that responsibility on my shoulders. What we'd talked about, prepared for, was really happening. It seemed impossible I'd get to sleep, but lying down in my bed, I slowed my breathing and focused on the mental exercises they'd taught me, and sure enough, within minutes, I'd fallen into a deep sleep. I was awoken by my mother, wrapping a backpack on the floor next to my bed. A recording from the overseer was playing over the vault intercom, talking about reclamation day. Time to get up and dress, Valeria. She handed me my vault suit and left the room. I took one last hot shower before getting ready. Father had said that we might not find hot water again until we reached the White Spring. Out in the real world, we'd have to scrounge for what we needed or even take it if necessary. As I walked into the kitchen, my parents both smiled and said that we'd be leaving now that most of the other residents had left. 
I followed them through the now empty vaults, and all I could think of was how much I wanted to leave this place. We took the supplies offered by the bots on our way out, and when the vault door opened for us, I got to see the sun for the first time. I remember thinking it was a lot brighter than I expected, and everything just smelled so real. As I was taking in my first sight of Appalachia, my mother went down and talked to this Mr. Handy bot floating near a bunch of balloons. She came back up and told us that the overseer had left a message, that she'd gone ahead and that we should follow. My father laughed and said that he'd let those other fools, which I took to mean the other residents, chase their tails, but that we had a job to do. This is what they'd been training me for since as long as I could remember. Now, here we were, in Appalachia, with our own mission. We needed to get to the White Spring. We needed to get to the Enclave. The three of us started down the hill, walking into the unknown. My mother found the corpse of a civilian just down from the vault entrance, with a note saying that he had been part of some group called the Responders. Sounds communist to me, said my father as he did a quick search of the body, grabbing a small amount of supplies and a machete. From our vantage point, we could see Appalachia spread out before us, from the smoky south, east to the mountains, and west to the Ohio River. We'd been traveling for a couple of days, mostly at night, to avoid the attention of the local wildlife and our fellow vault dwellers. Leaving the vault, my father said he couldn't believe how quiet it was. He said before the war, you could hear the huge excavators from the mines all the way up here. Nothing was as my parents expected. There were no people, no traffic, no activity at all. Then there was the wildlife. We found mutated dogs, wolves, and the most horrifying discovery, what must, at one time, have been people. There were two kinds. The first were what my father started calling ghouls. They were feral creatures, horribly burned or somehow transformed by exposure to radiation. We couldn't communicate with them, and they attacked us on sight. Luckily, my father had found a small stash of weapons in a small hilltop shack, and I was able to put my skills to good use. A few 10 millimeter rounds put them down just fine. The second group was far more dangerous. My father stumbled upon them at a local farm, just south of the vault. From a distance, it appeared that the farm was occupied by actual people. They didn't move like the ghouls we found earlier, and the wind even carried what we thought at the time was conversation. Leaving my mother and I to cover him from a small knoll just east of the farm, he made his way, cautiously, up to the farmhouse. The figures we saw earlier were probably inside, and I watched him slip through a side entrance. We heard the sound of a gunshot, and it quickly escalated into a full-scale firefight. Both my mother and I sprinted to the farm, moving from cover to cover, as my father backed out of the house, firing as he went. I took up a flanking position to cover the rear half of the house, when I was taken under fire from a storage structure at the rear of the property. The firing was erratic, but I could hear the snap of the bullets over my head, and they were too close for comfort. Leaning over, I adjusted my aim at the figure standing in the door of the storage unit, in the half-light, whoever he was just didn't look right. There seemed to be some kind of glow, and I could hear some kind of hissing sound. I fired off a few rounds, missed, but corrected my aim and saw the figure collapse in the doorway. I turned my attention back to the farmhouse where my parents had gone back inside. I continued to scan the area for other threats and saw more movement in the barn to the left of the house. It looked like there were at least three more people in there, and I had to assume they were as hostile as the others we'd found. Ducking behind the fence, I worked my way around to the side of the barn to get in behind them. I could hear them moving inside, and after peeking around the corner, I spun in and shot the first two in the back, watching them drop to the floor of the barn. Lining up on the third, all I heard was the click of a jam. The person turned around and moved into the light. Even as he raised his shotgun, all I could see was his hideous face. It looked like he was burned, with yellow eyes and some kind of green crystals growing out of his skin. My father had warned me about hesitating, but I was frozen to the spot. The boom was loud in the barn, and I flinched, only to see the thing topple over in front of me with a smoking hole in the back of its head 
and my parents standing in the doorway of the barn, both now holding pump-action shotguns. Val, are you okay? My mother crossed the barn, sidestepping the corpses and checking me for wounds before hugging me. Staring at the body, and now seeing that its two compatriots were in the same condition, I could barely speak. Who? I mean, what are those things? Father was examining the bodies, tugging on the green protrusions and rummaging through their pockets for identification or anything of value. He looked up at me. I don't know, Val. The people in the house are exactly the same, and yes, they are people. It looks like these are the folks that lived here. I found identification papers in the house and on the bodies. He handed me a West Virginia driver's license with the name Francis Abernathy on it. The picture of the middle-aged man in no way looked like the desiccated body on the floor. When I went into the house, these people were immediately hostile. Your mother and I were forced to kill them. They appear to be able to use weapons, as you saw here, but they don't communicate at all. All we heard was broken English and hissing. This may be some kind of disease or something from the bombs. We just don't know, he explained. But this ramps up the threat level significantly for all of us. We need to get to the White Spring Bunker and see what they know about this. We also need to restock and recheck all of our weapons. We can't have any more jams, because next time your mother and I may not be here to save you. I may have blushed at that last comment. I should have known better and checked my weapon first. Sorry, sir. It won't happen again. He rose to his feet and put his hands on my shoulders, looking me in the eye. Val, we trained you well, and so far you've given us no reason to doubt your abilities. But this isn't the vault. Remember what we taught you, follow our lead, and you'll be just fine. Thank you, sir. We spent the next few hours going through the rest of the property. We found several things that looked like statues. Outlines of people, but seemingly made of stone, covered in the same kind of growths as the others, but when we touched them, they all crumbled into a mix of dust and debris giving off radiation. Our pit boys were able to warn us of the worst of it, and we started giving them a wide berth. Having found some additional weapons and a workbench to perform basic repairs, we gathered in the farmhouse at dusk to plan out our next moves. The robot outside of Vault 76 had said the overseer had gone ahead and that we, as former residents, should follow her. Although our mission was to get to White Spring as quickly as possible, the fact that we were now faced with this new threat meant getting more information was a priority, especially if it was something the Enclave needed to be made aware of, or even just bring them more data on whatever this was. My father was going to scout ahead while my mother and I got some rest in the farmhouse. We took turns on watch, and it was eerily quiet in the area, hardly the sound of animals and nothing in the sky either, except for the sprinkling of constellations, most of which were not nearly as recognizable as the books had made them out to be and the moon, which was quite a bit brighter and more striking than they conveyed. But a little after midnight, I thought I heard something. It sounded like the flapping of wings. But it quickly faded away, and I convinced myself that I'd been imagining things. Of course, we found out later that I was wrong. It doesn't. Long gone are the days where people sing about West Virginia as almost heaven. After nuclear war and disease, it's far from heaven now. Far From Heaven, a Fallout 76 story podcast, is a tale of survival, conflict and hope set in the Fallout 76 game world. Join our survivors on their journey to reach that almost heaven once more. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon and many other great podcasts and apps. Far From Heaven. Fallout 76 story, available now. He returned a few hours later, before dawn. My father said that the overseer's camp was there, but abandoned. It had supplies we could use, and a note pointing to a town in the area called Flatwoods. He hadn't wanted to press on too far, but if this town was populated, it would be an opportunity to get more information and maybe even transportation to White Springs. Mother quizzed him on other details, and I could tell the two of them had fallen back into the familiar routines from when they'd worked together before the war. We started traveling in daylight now because my mother said it would be easier to spot potential trouble. 
To replace my broken 10mm, they gave me a 308 hunting rifle, while they both carried the shotguns, which we'd found plenty of ammunition for back on the farm. We were also able to craft some basic leather armor, which offered at least some measure of protection beyond our simple vault suits. We ran into some mongrel dogs and what could only be described as some kind of cross between moles and rats. Mother took a pretty nasty bite from one of them as it burrowed right up from the ground beneath her, but luckily we had plenty of medical supplies to take care of it. But when we did get to Flatwoods, it wasn't what we expected at all. When we got to the town, we found that it was abandoned. All that was left were the remains of the extensive camps and shops that these responders set up. There was also a vendor bot who sold things priced in caps? I guess Nuka-Cola bottle caps were being used as some form of currency. Father said we should start collecting these caps, as it could prove useful in our journey. There were also holotapes and terminals which talked about the responders and the people who were here after the bombs. Mother and father spent most of the day going through all the information they could find and taking lots of notes. They sent me to go through the rest of the town, investigate, and report back to them. There were plenty of corpses, including more of those frozen statue people. The town looked like it had been abandoned in a hurry, given how much was left behind. I did get in some good target practice, however. There were more of those ghouls out by an old red rocket. The hunting rifle did good work on them, but they were highly aggressive and charged at me as soon as they heard the first shot. The killing never bothered me. The ends justify the means, was what my father always said. Afterwards, I collected as much useful scrap and food as I could find and returned back to the church before nightfall. I found my parents finishing up on the responder terminal and told them about my search of the rest of the town. They would take turns asking questions about what I'd seen and done and examine the materials I brought back. When I asked what they had found, they said that Flatwoods had been the responder's base of operations for a long time but had moved north to Morgantown Airport. I asked them if we were going to the airport. For my geography lessons in the vault, I knew that it was pretty far in the opposite direction of where we had planned to travel. My father looked up from his notes and frowned. No, it looks like something catastrophic has affected the region. Rather than go chasing our tails, your mother and I agree that it would be better for us to get to White Spring as quickly as possible. We've been able to gather enough supplies, weapons, and ammunition to get us there. Your father is correct, continued my mother. We're not going to be much good to the Enclave if we're just running around the West Virginia hills without a plan. But we'll spend the night here, collect anything else we might need, and head east in the morning. Lucky for us, these responders had left bedrolls and even places for a campfire. After cooking up some charred meat and sitting down for dinner, Father walked me through our rolls for the trip tomorrow. How he'd scout ahead of us with Mother bringing up the rear and that I was to be in the middle, prepared to help either of them out should we make contact with any hostiles. Because of the mountains directly to the east, we'd have to travel southeast towards a town called Somerville before attempting to find a crossing to White Spring. We didn't know exactly how long it would take, given that we'd be walking the entire way. Later, as my mother and I were turning in, father came over to me. Val, just in case, you need to know how to get into the bunker. Now, before you say anything, yes, we're all going to get there together, but if anything should happen, you won't be let into the bunker without proper credentials. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a thick, laminated card. This is a congressional ID. All of the pre-war politicians assigned to the bunker were given one. As part of our mission, your mother and I received one, too. If anything happens, you take the card and present it to the Enclave. The staff and the resident AI will recognize it and allow you entry. After we finally figured out how to get the vendor bot to shut up, it was a quiet evening with the sound of the creek behind us and the wind rustling through the trees outside. The three of us took turns standing watch over the empty town. As I lay down, I thought how strange it was that just a week ago we were all stuffed into an overcrowded vault and yet now it felt like we might just be the last people in the whole world. Those were the thoughts that finally saw me off to sleep. Wake up, Val. It's time to go. My mother was leaning over me, already dressed in her vault suit and armor. Shaking the sleep from my eyes and leaning up, I could see Father already packing up the last of his equipment and shouldering his backpack. He turned to us. Team, I'm going to scout ahead and we'll be back in an hour. Be ready to go as soon as I return. He left the church and headed down the road, cradling his pump shotgun. 
my mother handed me a pile of apparel. Valeria, I've found some additional armor and clothes for you. You can get cleaned up and change in the back. I'll finish here and open up some rations for us. It'll be a long day today, so remember to pace yourself and be prepared. You do exactly what we trained you to do. She gave me a quick hug and left to give me some privacy. While the facilities here were primitive, especially compared to the running water and hot showers in the vault, I was able to at least clean off some of the accumulated grime and feel partially human again. The clothes and boots my mother found were almost the right size and fit neatly over a new set of leather armor that she found upstairs. I laughed, because the previous owner might have felt differently about its effectiveness, as I was able to put my fingers through three obvious bullet holes in the torso. But it was still better than nothing. Coming back out front, my mother handed me a backpack and a hunting rifle. At the appointed time, we saw my father jogging back up the street towards the church. Okay, team. I scouted a few miles down the road, had to kill a couple of those burnt-looking things, and found a note referencing something called Scorched. I think that might be what the people around here named those things, so unless someone tells us otherwise, that's what we'll call them too. Let's move out together, and when we get south of town, I'll continue ahead. Val, you follow behind and your mother will cover our rear. Any questions? I looked at my mother and back to my father, and I could tell that they were definitely back in their element and confident. And maybe I was a little surprised that I, too, was confident. The nervousness from before was gone. I chambered around in my hunting rifle, and we all started down the road. For the first few days, we settled back into routine. My father would lead, and my mother would cover, and I would keep pace between them. Only a few times did we have to stop and change course to either avoid obstructions blocking our way or more creatures we didn't recognize. And I swear, one of them looked like some kind of bear, but it was enormous. In this area of Appalachia, there seemed to be plenty of supplies to gather and food to be had, which made the absence of people all the more surprising and worrying. A few times at night, I could hear my parents talking about what they'd found. Though I couldn't hear everything they said, it sounded like they were confused. They had tried to pick up Enclave radio broadcasts from their pit boys but all they got was static. Appalachia appeared to be completely empty. Empty except for the monsters. Everything changed on the eighth day. The weather, which until then had been sunny and warm, suddenly turned into a torrential downpour. We were caught out in the open, and my father ran back to get the two of us. We all hurried over to a ruined house down at the end of a dirt road. Between the rain, lightning, and thunder that seemed to roil the entire region, we did what we could to keep our supplies and ourselves dry. The rain kept up for hours, which meant that the river we were supposed to cross would probably be flooded. Getting stuck here wasn't part of the plan, but even then my parents didn't seem concerned. It was still midday, and they spoke about moving further south once the rain let up to check the local bridges or find a more secure place to hole up for a few days. In hindsight, we should have been more careful. Not that we had gotten complacent, but we still didn't understand the true dangers of Appalachia. The rain had begun to taper off, and my father was anxious to get moving again. He got as far as putting his hand on the doorframe when we heard a screech from outside, followed Where? by hissing and a burst of gunfire. It was only my father's quick reflexes which saved his life as bullets chewed through the doorframe. He rolled back into the house, and both my mother and I fired blindly out the front door and windows to cover him. I don't know where they all came from, but there must have been dozens of those scorched things in front of the house. The rain masked their approach, and now they were right on top of us. We all heard the breaking glass and wood as they forced their way in the back door. My mother turned to deal with the ones in the back, while my father and I started shooting out the windows at the ones in front. There were so many of them, almost like a small horde. One leapt through the bay window, shattering the remaining glass. It tackled my father to the ground, spilling the contents of his backpack all over the floor and knocking his shotgun across the room. Wielding my rifle like a club, I knocked the scorched off my father and put a bullet between its eyes. I grabbed my father's arm to lift him up and handed him back the shotgun. He just nodded and started firing again at the horde outside. We were running through our ammunition at a frightening pace. My mother returned from the back, having killed the half dozen or so which tried to break in that way. She was bleeding from a bullet graze on her arm, but was otherwise unhurt. We fired another volley out front, knocking down several of the creatures, but they were massing again for another attack. In that brief moment of calm, 
My father explained that we were going to have to make a run for it, that there were too many of them. We grabbed as much as we could carry, alternating shots at the creatures to keep them at bay. My father grabbed my arm. Val, I want you to go first. You head out the back door and run north. We'll cover and then join you right after. We'll meet a half a mile up the road at the intersection with the wreck Cordova and pick em up truck. You know the one? Yes, sir, I know the one, but we should stick... And that was as far as I got, when suddenly a shadow fell over the house, and the air was filled with the sound of flapping wings. Enormous wings. We all turned towards the window when the entire house exploded around us. The last thing I remembered was flying through the air, and the inhuman shrieks. Pain. That's the first thing I felt. My entire body seemed to come alive at once with pain. I tried to lift my head and immediately bumped into something hard. The pain blossomed again, pounding through my skull. I fought the panic that started to set in and tried to calm myself. After a few minutes, I was able to get my bearings and my head throbbed just a little less. Everything was dark when I opened my eyes. And when I felt around with my hands, it seemed like a big part of the house, maybe a wall, had fallen on top of me, trapping me underneath. I didn't want to cry out or make too much noise. Those scorched could still be around. Instead, I just listened. For what seemed like ages, I couldn't hear much of anything, other than the wind and the dripping of water somewhere close. Satisfied that I wasn't in any immediate danger, I tried moving again, slowly pulling myself out from underneath the rubble. I couldn't raise my pit boy up to see what time it was. I could have been out for minutes or even hours. Moving a wrecked bookcase out of the way, I was finally able to pull myself out. My clothes were in tatters and barely any of my armor was left, seemingly torn to pieces in whatever explosion we were caught in. The house around me was almost completely flat, the walls blown down, and the second story collapsed on the first. The sun was beginning to peek over the nearby hills. In the faint light of dawn, I dropped to my knees and started looking for my parents. I whispered, Sir? Ma'am? Then, Mom? Dad? As I crawled through the debris. At first, I thought they were gone, that perhaps they had escaped and would be coming back for me because I couldn't find any trace of them. Then I found my mother's backpack. It had been ripped open, and worse covered in blood. Inside, there was an old med kit which I used to bandage up the cuts on my arms. I kept looking, turning over furniture and checking under walls to see if I could find them. A few minutes later, I did. They had died together. My mother had been impaled on a broken frame post, probably from the explosion, while my father was next to her, holding her hand while his shotgun was in the other. The Scorched must have found him wounded and killed him. I dropped to my knees. My family was gone. There were parts of me that wanted to cry, to scream, but that's not how they trained me, and that's not what they would have wanted. Instead, I swallowed those feelings, the grief and the hate and I conjured up their voices in my head. When you're on a mission, that's the only thing that matters. I took their wedding rings and put them in my pocket. Remembering what my father told me, I looked through his pockets for the congressional ID card, but it wasn't there. The pocket had been torn open. I checked for my mother's card, too, and it was also gone. I cursed silently to myself and looked around the rubble for them. I spent precious minutes and even took the chance to turn on my Pip-Boy light, but I never found it. How was I going to get into the bunker without it? Taking a deep breath, I closed my eyes and thought through the problem. My father mentioned that many of the local bigwig politicians had been given these cards. There was always a chance that I could track down another one, and that was just one of the many problems I'd have to overcome. First. I said my goodbyes to my parents, closing their eyes and resting my hands on their heads. We didn't believe in that sort of thing, but I did make them a silent vow that I would finish what they started. 
Collecting what little supplies I could find, I thought back to the overseer. She'd left a trail to follow, and what my father said about the Morgantown airport. It wasn't much, but it was all I had to go on. In the ruins, I found an old cap and a tattered overcoat. Putting them on and throwing the backpack over my shoulder, I started back up the dirt road. When I got to the end of the lane, I looked south one last time, before turning and walking away. As the sun started to rise over the hills, I set my mind to the task at hand. I would find a way to the bunker, to the enclave, and I would let nothing stand in my way. The little lies we tell ourselves. Everything will be okay. The rest of the story will have to wait for another day. I have a staff meeting in 15 minutes, and it would be unbecoming for the commanding officer to be late. I'll upload this recording for Modus and be on my way. Thank you again, members, for joining us for this special episode of The Modus Files. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, and better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on Twitter at Modus Files for more information about our podcast, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the Enclave. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave, and God bless America. Members, we look forward to your next visit to our little Enclave.